It seems like too often, design documentaries ends up being a post-mortem for a game. While I don't go out of my way to pick obscure titles, I end up talking about the lesser known examples because they're often the most interesting. I hope that maybe by me talking about them and what made them so enjoyable, they'll finally be recognized for what they were, and then people will gain the same experience that I have. And sometimes I'll come across a game that I assume people will miss out on. As much as I'm ashamed to admit it, I thought Stardew Valley was going to be one of those games. And I've never been happier to be wrong. Not that I thought Stardew Valley didn't have the potential to be successful. Having followed the project not long after its Steam Greenlight reveal in 2012, I was instantly a fan. But being released in a year where big titles such as Dark Souls 3, Doom, and Overwatch, I was definitely worried that Stardew Valley would be lost in a sea of great titles. It didn't seem to have the mass appeal that many of those titles commanded. I mean, come on, it's a game about farming. As hyperbolic of a statement this may be, it's a game about literally watching grass grow. And almost everyone I know who was introduced to it had the same initial reaction. Oh, hey, Silver. What you playing? Oh, hey, Icart. Uh, it's this game called Stardew Valley. So, what is it? Just another RPG? Kinda. It's actually more of a farming sim. Like Farmville? No, no. This is, this is actually fun. So, what do you even do? Well, you start off with this rundown field, then you have to clear the field, then after that you gotta plant some seeds to grow crops, then after that you can sell those crops to buy more seeds, and eventually you keep doing that until you get a better watering can, so you can grow more crops. And, and why are you doing that? Well, right now I'm trying to save up enough money so I can get a bigger barn, so I can get more cows, so I can get some milk, so I can sell the milk. Wait, you mean to tell me that you don't fight? Don't beat a rival, you don't buy the whole village? It's the most boring thing I've ever heard. Now, here, just just try it for a bit. Sit down, play for a little bit. I gotta get to bed. I'll just come by and pick up my laptop in the morning, all right? Okay. Oh, wow, you're up early. I take it you like the game? Oh, hey, um, um, I haven't... I haven't slept yet. I uh, do have good news. Got my water and can level two. But Stardew Valley ended up being a success. And I don't mean, oh, it made a decent profit for an indie game success. I mean, holy crap, it sold how many copies? Success. Almost despite itself, Stardew Valley not only became one of the best games of 2016, but also one of the best game design stories. But what exactly made Stardew Valley so good? Well, that's what we're here to find out. This is Design Documentaries. And today we're looking at Concerned Apes Farming Simulation, Stardew Valley. It's almost impossible to talk about Stardew Valley without bringing up its predecessor, Harvest Moon. It's no surprise that Stardew Valley was heavily inspired by Harvest Moon since, well, it's intentionally designed to be a Harvest Moon. From its mechanics and art style, to how NPCs carry conversation, it's all done to invoke nostalgia from fans of the series. But interestingly, Stardew Valley and Harvest Moon have more in common than just the gameplay, with the development itself having more than a few similarities. Harvest Moon was originally developed by Packinsoft, the company where the game's designer, Yasuhiro Wada, first started. He started working as a production assistant for PC Engine games, with Packinsoft publishing games such as Metal Angel and... An adventure in a otaku galaxy where you... Oh, oh no. Uh, 
Cut this joke. Cut it. Cut! Yasuhiro Wada came up with the idea of Harvest Moon after reminiscing about his hometown and Miyazaki, after having moved to Tokyo to become a game developer. Having an appreciation for his rural upbringing, Wada started designing the concept of a game he called Ranch Story, or Harvest Moon as it was known outside of Japan. Having taken his own inspiration from games like Legend of Zelda, Sim City, and a Japanese horse racing sim known as Derby Stallion, he set out to create a game that was different from any other game being released. It was a game without conflict, with no defined goals or plot. In a world before The Sims or Animal Crossing, when action platformers ruled the day, it was difficult to imagine how you'd even design such a game. Even the publisher Packinsoft was so hesitant about the idea, it took Wada two years of pressing before the project was greenlit. However, that would only be the start of a troubled three and a half year development cycle. Wada realized that making a game about hard labor fun proved more difficult than he anticipated. He kept adding different aspects such as growing crops, upgrading tools, and building relationships which ended up turning into series staples today. But development was slow as the project kept hitting roadblocks. The amount of objects on screen that had caused the frame rate to drop to 10 frames per second, requiring revision after revision. And during this time, Sony had already released the PlayStation, meaning that Harvest Moon was now a last generation release, which would inevitably limit sales and exposure for the title. But those were simple problems considering what would come next. Packinsoft's financial crisis. The publisher was going under, the president of the company literally went missing, and the budgets for all the projects were being cut or cancelled. The Harvest Moon development team went from 8 people to 3. The game Wada had spent years making was on the edge of never being released. Harvest Moon only had 6 months to be finished and was only about 30% complete. Wada was about ready to call this project a failure. However, his remaining team encouraged him to complete the game, so they brought in their sleeping bags and ended up sleeping in the offices overnight. In those six months, they managed to complete Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon only sold about 20,000 units in its first few months, but word of mouth spread and the game became a moderate success that, surprising even Wada, received an English localization. The success wasn't able to save Packinsoft from a merger with Victor Entertainment, but Natsume, the publisher who maintained the rights to Harvest Moon, almost immediately greenlit a sequel for the next-gen consoles. Having been given a bigger budget and a team, they started work on Harvest Moon 64, which was closer to the original concept that Yasuhiro Wada intended. And despite Natsume not even getting their own name right in the game, it sold almost half a million copies. You could say that Harvest Moon became the big cash cow for Natsume. The publisher had no qualms about releasing sequel after spinoff, and the result was... A PlayStation reimagining of Harvest Moon 64, three PlayStation 2 games, three GameCube games, a Game Boy game, three Game Boy Color games, two Game Boy Advance games, 11... 11... 11 Nintendo DS games? 11? Let that sink in for a bit. 11! Four Wii games, a couple of PSP ports, 8, 3, 8... You know what? I'm done. That is far too many Harvest Moon games. I'm going out to the bar, and I'm gonna give me some juice. The issue wasn't just Natsume and later Marvelous Entertainment flooding the market with these games. It was that each iteration in an effort to keep things fresh had taken Harvest Moon from its simple farming simulation roots and created more complex games. Some games focused heavily on the romance building aspects, others removed the dating elements entirely. Some games were just glorified achievement hunts. Some games barely focused on the farming at all. At some point, Harvest Moon went from a simple game about growing crops and meeting people to... Hi there! My name's Sabrina! Nice to meet you! 
Hey, have you ever heard of a place called Sky Tree Village? Underneath the beauty of the village, there's a serious problem. The Harvest Goddess has lost most of her power because the villagers have forgotten about her. One way I'm trying to give the Harvest Goddess her power back is by growing a lot of crops. Have you ever heard of a Poatu donkey? I hadn't either. And but besides farming, there are a couple of guys here who have caught my eye. Make high quality clothes with their fur. And when I upgrade my tools, I maybe there will be wedding bells in my future with one of them. I know it's gonna I'll be tough, but I'm gonna give it all I've got to take care of you. I'm here. doing the there best I can, can to get the the and, and that's a promise. Harvest Moon, Sky Tree Village. Yeah. That's not to discount the contribution the series made to game design. Without it, we wouldn't have had Stardew Valley or arguably games like Animal Crossing or The Sims. And that was a world that almost existed. But because of the dedication of a few passionate developers, Harvest Moon was able to lay the groundwork in these life sims and cultivate a fan base that Stardew Valley would later harvest. I keep telling you no one likes puns. Your background isn't balanced. I saw you look at your script. No one cares about your meta-narrative, Sober. <sighs> Despite being the dynasty warriors of farming sims, Harvest Moon still had a fairly dedicated fanbase. A fanbase that Stardew Valley creator Eric Barone was part of. He was frustrated with the series because in his own words, Harvest Moon became progressively worse after Harvest Moon Back to Nature, an opinion that many fans shared. Having given up on the series around Harvest Moon Animal per Parade? Is that seriously the title? Is there actually... <coughs> oh yeah, I, I guess there are animals, and they are definitely parading. Anyway, Eric couldn't let go of the enjoyment he found in the older entries in the series and tried to rekindle that flame with Minecraft mods. But that wasn't quite enough for Eric. After realizing that Natsume wasn't interested in making a more traditional Harvest Moon, and that no one else was going to make it, Eric decided that the only reasonable course of action was to make it himself. By himself. That's right, the developer Concerned Ape only consists of Eric Baroni himself. He designed, programmed, developed the art assets, and composed the music for Stardew Valley. Originally, it was only meant to sharpen his skills as a programmer, but upon what could be considered overwhelming support for his Steam Greenlight trailer released in September 2012, he decided to make Stardew Valley into a full-fledged game. It definitely wasn't simple. Designer slash programmer slash artist slash composer slash pretty sure secret alien superhero but no proof of it yet was spending 10 hours a day for four years working on Stardew Valley. It was fortunate that Chucklefish Games, developer of Starbound and publisher of games like Risk of Rain, offered to help produce Stardew Valley, allowing him to focus on development and allowed him to avoid using early access or other crowdfunding methods. However, even then, Eric struggled with what most creators go through. Burnout. Creators go through. Burnout. Man, I've been editing this for a while. Maybe I should take a break. No, no, I got, I gotta get this done. There were times when Eric just scrapped his project and started all over claiming he hated his own game and not even being able to judge if his game was good. He admitted that the only thing keeping him going was the fact that he already dedicated so much time to it and everyone was counting on him to make it. Ladies and gentlemen, Stardew Valley, brought to us by Concerned Ape, Chucklefish Games, and the Sunk Cost Fallacy. And so, after those four years, on February 26, 2016, Stardew Valley released on Steam and ended up selling over a million copies within its first two months of its release. 
not only has it been more successful than any Harvest Moon release, but it managed to even outperform games like Dark Souls 3 and Civilization 6. It was the indie success story that led to Gama Sutra naming Eric as one of its indie developers of the year. It's almost poetic that Stardew Valley and Harvest Moon had such a similar history. From their vision of the designers, to the long struggling development history, to the success story that followed. But while it's nice to celebrate the success and the achievements of both Yasuhiro Wada and Eric Baroni, the question remains, out of all genres, what's so appealing about a farming sim? The story of Stardew Valley couldn't have started off with anything more appropriate. Your character becomes fed up with working 60 plus hours a week at a soulless, go-nowhere job. Instead of quitting to start his own YouTube channel, then having to wake up every day worrying that he's only one YouTube algorithm from losing everything and becoming homeless, instead ends up inheriting his grandfather's rundown farm and decides to live there. And that's it. After that, it's all up to you. You're given a few things you can do, like talk to the villagers and start planting crops, but that's the most direction the game gives you. There aren't any rivals to beat or goddesses to save. You aren't trying to prevent a theme park from taking over your land. The game doesn't end like, What? You're not married? You've been in this town for a whole year! I want no loser son who makes careful commitments! How do you think I met your mother? Get out of here! I stare at the stars and the sky up above and think, what am I? Stardew Valley is really about making your own goals. Normally it would feel overwhelming to have so much to do in such little direction, but the game is exceptionally good at providing those opportunities for you. The greatest example is your farmland itself. It's obviously seen better times. Most players will resolve to clear the land, or at least a section of it, so you can use it to grow crops and that requires you to cut down the trees, pull the weeds, and break the rocks. All of which give you materials such as wood, stones, and fiber. However, you don't have a lot of energy, so you might be tired before your day is over. So you have time to forge for food and make some extra money by selling what you don't need. Or you can trade them to the townsfolk and build relationships. As you clear the field, you'll find a stump that your axe can't break. So then you'll go to the mine and collect materials and, again, either selling or giving away what you don't need in order to upgrade your axe. After spending days in-game with this process, you finally have your field cleared, only to discover that now you have enough space and materials to build a barn and a chicken coop. Not only that, but you've also learned how to craft some tree tappers. But that villager you were trading your findings to taught you that recipe for baked fish. And you haven't even touched the fishing yet. And to cook, you'll need to upgrade the house. Which means that you now have new goals to accomplish. And the game did all this without having to make some sort of checklist for you. This doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's actually one of the most important parts regarding Stardew Valley's design. Intrinsic Motivation The gameplay in Stardew Valley mostly consists of pressing a button to accomplish something, while managing a meter that tells you how many times you can press a button, and a clock that tells you how long you have to press buttons. Admittedly, not a very satisfying mechanic. However, because you initially defined your own goals, and aren't just doing it because the game told you, what ends up being satisfying is setting out to do something, accomplishing it, and the sense of fulfillment that comes with it. The game doesn't have to artificially reward you in order to make a certain option seem more enticing, mainly because you came to the conclusion that you wanted to do it yourself in the first place. Even better, the fact that the gameplay of Stardew Valley is so simple, 
it can be enjoyed by pretty much anyone, regardless of age or experience or even playstyle preferences. Since you aren't forced to meet any standards other than your own, you can essentially play how you want. Want to make a large amount of money by maximizing profits with crops? Go for it. Want to woo that special someone and have a family? That's great. Just want to spend most of your day fishing and relaxing to the sounds of an ocean? That's perfectly valid. Be a forester, be a miner, be friends with a miner. Become an alcoholic, become a Jedi, become an alcoholic Jedi. <laughs> Feel free to do whatever you want. And this ties into another design choice that made Stardew Valley so enjoyable. And that's how the game rewards you. Or, more precisely, how the game delays its rewards to you. Almost everything in Stardew Valley takes time. Crops take anywhere from 4 to 14 days to grow. It often takes days for upgrades to finish and you simply don't have enough energy or time to accomplish your own goals. Even selling things to your bin has you wait to the next in-game day before you see the return. Stardew Valley is filled with delayed gratification. This is something almost universally avoided in traditional games, where instant gratification is often the most used. Most games can't give you the rewards fast enough, Beat an enemy in an RPG and you're usually greeted to... Congratulations, you win! Take all these experience points and gold! And congratulations on your new level! Here's a new spell! And have some random items! Have some flashy effects and look at those numbers go up! You like numbers going up, don't you? And I'm not trying to discount the importance of giving instant gratification. Feedback is incredibly important when it comes to game design. However, it's not always needed. The problem with instant gratification in games is that it often kills pacing. We often associate value with effort and rarity. So the more time it takes to get something, the better it feels when we get it. There is absolutely no reason why it takes the blacksmith two days to upgrade your axe. It's data. It's processed faster than we can think. However, we had to work for that upgrade. We had to spend days going into the depths of the mine, surviving the deadly creatures, oftentimes collapsing due to exhaustion to find the rare ore needed. You wait, staring at that stubborn log that has been keeping you from untold secrets, as the blacksmith forges the blade in the purifying flames of Pelican Town. This wait, which is only really simulating scarcity, makes the accomplishment that much more satisfying. And because Stardew Valley is about creating these personal goals, it can afford to hold on to these rewards and create this sense of delayed gratification. And this builds towards Stardew Valley's most incredible achievement, its addictive gameplay. In some ways, Stardew Valley has less in common with Farming Simulator and more with Civilization. And I don't mean that in the sense that Gandhi is growing nukes in his field. It creates this one more day mentality that makes it hard to put down. This constant feedback of hard work and accomplishment that makes you say, Oh, I can do one more day before bed. And before you know it, the sun is rising. As explained before, everything in Stardew Valley is based on days, from your energy to your crops, your upgrades and town events. It's usually impossible to do everything you want in one day. Even something as simple as upgrading your barn takes time to earn the money and resources required. But each day you're working towards an end goal. And there's usually always something going on. Maybe tomorrow it's raining so you have more time and energy to explore the mine. Then the day after that your strawberries should be ready to pick and sell. Meaning you should be able to get that barn upgrade two days later. Oh, and then the spring dance should be happening. I stare at the stars and the sky above and think, what am I made of? 
Then after that, it's the first day of summer, which means you'll have to plant all new crops. There's almost always something to do, and by the time you finished one project, you've already started on the next one. And before you know it, you're having to explain this to a friend that you didn't get any sleep because you've been farming all night. And having to justify why that concept is so much fun. Might I recommend sharing this video to save you some time, just so you can keep playing. Stardew Valley somehow managed to understand just how important these elements were in its design. That it managed to avoid all the pitfalls that later Harvest Moons would fall into. It would seem like giving more direction and more rewards would end up making a better game, but sometimes simplicity and allowing the player to find their own fun are just as important. No doubt something Eric Barome understood from being a fan of Harvest Moon and Wada's original designs. And that's not the end of Stardew Valley's story. Even after a very successful launch and a career-defining moment for Eric, the man isn't taking a break, and in fact is working harder than ever to improve his game to include more crops, more late-game content, and the biggest feature, co-op multiplayer. Thankfully, he's decided not to do everything on his own this time, allowing producer Chucklefish Games to handle things like localization and porting. And who knows what the future holds for Stardew Valley, or developer Concerned Ape after that. But the most touching aspect of all this was that on December 1st, 2016, PC Gamer published an interview where Eric finally got to meet the man that inspired him, Mr. Harvest Moon himself, Yasuhiro Wada. In the interview, Eric got to play Wada's upcoming game, Birthday's the Beginning and Wada played and commented on Stardew Valley. In Wada's own words, I told him I was very happy. Instead of Harvest Moon being forgotten, it became powered up and has gotten even better. It's still living on, even though I'm not working on it anymore. I'm really happy that's happening. After seeing Stardew Valley, I feel that it carries on the legacy of the original Harvest Moon very well because of the freedom you have in it. And Eric, Ending the interview by commenting, I'm humbled, I'm honored, and it's just, it's incredible to be sitting here next to Mr. Wada. I don't think he's old at all. <laughs> it just goes to show that you can pull an experience from anywhere. And just like a seed from a plant, you can eventually grow that experience into its own thing. And gaining that experience builds character. This is Soberdorf. Thanks for watching. What am I doing with my life? It's the right decision, sober. New YouTube comment? Yes, I better check that. This was the right decision.